business before we get started this morning. So was, we, uh, we need to elect our nominating committee for the, for the uh, church officers and uh, I will call on Jenny Clemmer to, to, to confirm that there is a quorum present. Uh, let's join together in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for this day and for all the opportunities it represents to us. We thank you for this community of faith. Pray your blessing upon us as we seek to be faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. The nominating committee is a, is a great uh, part of our tradition to elect uh, new officers each year. And uh, I'm going to call up Mark Clemens to present the slate of names this morning. Good morning. Good morning. So every year our uh, nominating committee has um, a, a chair or, or a chair of the nominating committee who is an elder in their third uh, year on session, um, a second elder who is in their second year who will be uh, rising to be the chair the following year, and um, a deacon. And those three positions this year will be filled by me as chair, by Richard Meyer as elder who will be rising chair, and Eva Pearson. Um, I would also like to place in name in nomination three names for members at large uh, who would join us um, as we search for um, elders and deacons uh, for the next three-year terms. Um, those names are Rebecca Combs, Larry Maston, and Jerry Morey. Hearing that slate of names, are there any additions, nominations from the floor? Hearing none, I'd ask if you're ready to vote. All those in favor of electing this group as our nominating committee, say aye. 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 Opposed? So moved. Hey, So welcome, now that we've conducted a little bit of business, I've got a couple of more quick announcements to make before we get started. Uh, you've got two musical opportunities coming up. Um, this afternoon, we've got, and this is noted in your bulletin, we have the Morning Star Flute Ensemble. Gonna be, we are hosting them here in our uh, sanctuary. I heard them practice yesterday, they sound wonderful, and I would encourage each of you to uh, consider attending. Um, Lynette will be selling tickets to this event, uh, in our narthex after the service. Uh, following week, next Sunday, we also have an opportunity over in our fellowship center. There's going to be a hand a handbell showcase um, in which the, the handbell choirs of three separate uh, congregations, First Baptist, 
First Broad Street and First Presbyterian will all participate and be presenting some musical numbers. So I would also encourage you, if you have any interest, to uh, attend that as well. Last year it was a lot of fun and it was quite well attended. So uh, for those of you who have not uh, been here before, please take note of the ritual of friendship pads at the end of your pews and pass those uh, back so you can get to know uh, your neighbors on, on the pew. Let us prepare our hearts for worship. stand for the call to worship. Here we have gathered, we have come to worship our risen Lord. Jesus has invited us here. Abide in me as I abide in you. We live in Jesus Christ. Those who abide in Jesus love us and flourish in God as we live in Christ, our lives are changed and our spirits renewed. We live in Christ, Christ and now we are here to worship and witness our life.
If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just. He will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In humility and faith, let us confess our sins to God. Let us pray. Holy God, we make no pretense about our lives. We forget, even deny, who we are called to be. You call us to be good stewards of creation and healer of wounds, but we doubt your power flowing through us. We are called to forgive wrongs and to offer blessings, but we hold on to hurt and hold back the word of praise. You tell us to share our faith and live our beliefs, but we hesitate, afraid to appear too religious. Fill us with hope and give us the courage to share what is truly good news, that God is love and that Christ is Lord. While we were yet captive to sin, Christ died for us. We have been brought out of darkness into God's marvelous light. So let us be vigilant as Christ's faithful disciples, encouraging one another. Friends, in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. confessed our sins and received forgiveness. As we are forgiven and reconciled to God through Christ Jesus, let us be reconciled to one another. The peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. Please share the peace of Christ with each other. <laughs> Crazy kids. <laughs> Peace of Christ. Good to see you. Peace, everybody. <laughs> double, double team it. Double team it. Be careful. Don't knock it right now. Put that back in the wrong right there so we don't bring that up. Life's better. Troy. You know what to do, right? Say peace to Mr. Mark. <clears throat> Good morning. Well, friends, you know I like my props. And this morning during our Sunday school, we made these little prayer chains. And it got me thinking, today we're talking about being connected to Jesus. Well, we're going to show a surprise in just a second. So what, what a few kids did in just about five minutes 
each one of these little chains has a prayer, whether it's a person, place, thing. And this is just about 10 minutes worth with just a couple, few kids. We only had three this morning, right? And we did this to remind ourselves that we are connected to each other and to God. And one of the ways we are connected is through prayer. Well, last weekend, as many of you know, we had our family camp, All Church Retreat, in Banner Elk. And we wanted to show you a little bit about what we did there with something like this. Caroline, can you and um, Troy, can you all go behind there and help me out and bring that up here? So if this is just what a little prayer does, this is what a lot of prayer does. <clears throat> Be careful. And kids, I need y'all to help me. We're going to bring this all the way down there. Y'all didn't think it was over, did you? Can y'all grab a little bit and bring it down there? Be beat. Easy, easy. Slow, 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 slow. Slow down, slow down. <laughs> Spread it out nice and easy. So without you knowing, many of these prayers maybe have some things happening in our church. Y'all can stop, y'all can stop, 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 stop. <laughs> They're very good listeners. Very literal. There we go. Yeah, spread it out, Troy. Come up here. We're going to add these prayers here this morning. And like I said, even though we didn't have everyone here with us last weekend, you were thought about and you were prayed. I know a few of these have church members on them and different situations. So we're going to add our prayers up here. And the kids, it's a very easy visual representation to remind ourselves that we are connected to each other and to God through prayer. And we're going to use this as a worship decoration this month during our Space for Grace worship. It's okay. So if this kind of makes you excited, next year we'd love to have... A lot more people come up to family camp, all church retreat, and join in the fun. So kids, thank y'all for helping the congregation see a little bit. And in the next newsletter, you can see more pictures about some things that we did. So I'll leave this up, you know, kind of out there if you wanted to look at some of the prayers and just see a little bit about what we did. But And this wasn't just kids, this was all ages that we were praying for you all and different things happening in our lives. So, friends, remember that we are connected to God in new and creative ways, especially through prayer. Isn't that cool? All right, let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for meeting us here in worship. Thank you for allowing us to pray to you so we can become closer to you in our relationship. Thank you for your son, and thank you for this church. Amen. All right, friends. Let us pray. Prepare our hearts, O oh God, to accept your word. Silence in us any voices but your own, so that we may hear your word and also do it. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Old Testament reading today is from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 2, verses 14 through 21. Listen for God's word. Is Israel a slave? Is he, home -born, is he a homeborn servant? Why then has he become plunder? The lions have roared against him. They have roared loudly. They have made his land a waste. His cities are in ruins without inhabitant. Moreover, the people of Memphis and Tapanis have broken the crown of your head. Have you not brought this upon yourself by forsaking the Lord your God while he led you in the way? What then do you gain by going to Egypt to drink the waters of the Nile? Or what do you gain by going to Assyria to drink the waters of the Euphrates? Your wickedness will punish you and your apostasies will convict you. Know and see that it is evil and bitter for you to forsake the Lord your God. The fear of me is not in you, says the Lord God of hosts. For long ago you broke your yoke and burst your bonds and you said, I will not serve. On every high hill and under every green tree, you sprawled and played the whore. 
Yet I planted you as a choice vine from the purest stock. How then did you turn degenerate and become a wild vine? Second reading added to that is taken from the Gospel of John. Opening words, chapter 15. I am the true vine, my father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me, you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are ga gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. But if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done. My Father is glorified by this that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. To save her brother's life, this woman gave him her bone marrow. As he was coming out of anesthesia, an interesting thing happened. As he opened his eyes, he saw her marrow being fed into him, the last few drops. And the nurse, noting his alert eyes, smiled at him and said, Randy, this is your new birthday. You've just been given new life. He lived another two years. He, he and his sister would often joke about her marrow again. You know, he was suddenly having mood swings. <laughs> I like the description of faith as the marrow of Christ. His spirit, his life flowing, if you will, in us. Dwelling within us, giving us hope and inspiration. The more we offer our lives to Christ, the more his life permeates ours. I would suggest to you that we need Jesus like we need oxygen, like we need water. Or to use the analogy he does today, like a branch needs a vine. Today we encounter one of his I am sayings that are unique to John's gospel. Where Jesus utters the Hebrew name of God that no Jew is allowed to utter. And attributes it to himself. I am the true vine, my father, the vine dresser. In other words, Jesus was organic before organic was food. <laughs> Vines and branches, they are linked, intimately connected. Vines bring life to branches. The strength is in their connection. Branches must stay connected to the source. If they don't, they suffer. Well, they literally perish. You've seen that in your garden. Jesus is the link and the conduit between us and God, the source of life for all who believe. We draw our life from him. A reporter once asked the great statesman and British author G.K. Chesterton, who had recently become a Christian, and the, the reporter was a little antagonistic about that idea, so you became a Christian. So I have a question for you. If the risen Christ suddenly appeared at this moment and stood behind you, what would you do? Chesterton looked at him and said, He is. Imagine if you live that way, trusting that Jesus is present, not just in theory, not just because it's in a book, but because it's reality to you. What if you could know him the way the disciples did? 
to, to have his joy flowing through you, his love coloring the way you view the world? The answer is you can. The answer is we must. His spirit indwells within us, shaping us, if you will, helping us to become what we were always meant to be. So this great image, this lesson on vines, takes place in his last prep call, if you will, trying to urge his disciples to remain faithful. And the main message he's trying to convey in these four chapters of John is that he would never truly leave them or desert them. He would be more powerfully present in the spirit than he was as the earthly Jesus. They probably had trouble accepting that. Some of us still do. But they were anxious about the future. And he could tell it in their eyes. They were not ready. And he had to wonder, would they ever reach their potential to carry on his work? And so seven times he drives this message home using the word abide. He who abides in me and I abide in him bears fruit. The Greek word abide means to live, to dwell, to stay, and continue. To stay connected to Jesus. This is not just a good message. It's essential to life. And the consequences are high because we know many people, and maybe even seasons of our lives where we have become disconnected. A young boy fell out of bed and did what children do. He screamed bloody murders. Mother came racing into the room, cradled him quickly into her arms, and he asked him, what happened? And he said, I don't know. I guess I stayed too close to where I got in. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you follow Christians as long as I have, it's basically what happens to us. We stay too close to where we got in. We get stuck in holding patterns. We start to think that I am what I am, and that's all I'll ever be. Wrong. The life God intends for us all is a life of maturity and growth, putting our faith into daily practice. As branches, we are dependent on Jesus. As he put it, bluntly, apart from me, you can do zilch. <laughs> that's not the word in Greek, but that's what it means. <laughs> Nothing. Apart from Jesus, we may have air in our lungs and two feet on the ground, but we do not have life as he sees it. And neither did his disciples yet. They would. There was no time left for him to explain himself anymore. He would never, he would be there to correct their every mistake, to show them how to do things the right way. And so his warning to them is kind of an eternal reminder to all his people. He who remains and abides in me bears fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing, absolutely nothing, of any lasting and substantial value. Now, for the record, vines and branches didn't start with Jesus. It's a reoccurring theme in the Old Testament. You heard Jeremiah, Isaiah echoed the same thing. That Israel had become a very disgraceful vineyard, unproductive, bearing not fruit, but Miserable by their unfaithfulness. But the image stuck. They were the vineyard. God was the vine dresser. To their credit, the Jews had become experts over time in vines and vineyards. They knew secrets like planting and grafting and pruning. And that may be part of the problem. They knew that agriculture. They just didn't get it spiritually. Because if plants failed to produce, a vine dresser plucked them up, dug them out. They wasted valuable space. Good vine dressers only planted choice vines and nurtured them so that they could enjoy the fruits of their land. So Jeremiah calls out his generation and many others, I planted you as a choice vine from the best stuff. How is it that you've become a wild vine? We could go all day wondering how wild the vines we are. But they got the point that God's protection was there only if they served his purpose. And his purpose was bearing fruit. Think about your life. What fruit have you borne? What impact have you made? The sad truth is we often produce more weeds than fruit. Our lives get overgrown. There's so much junk. All the 
surrounds us and weighs on us. So sometimes, sometimes God has to prune what he plans. I'll admit it, I don't like the word prune. You may be a non-pruner. The first time I pruned my plants, I got physically sick. I thought, you know, leave them alone. I pruned my daughter's plants once and she didn't talk to me for a week. <laughs> you know, it's an ugly word. Pruning is terrible. Leave them alone. The truth is, is that appearances can be seen in gardens and in life. Appearances, the plant's health, like a person's spiritual health, can be all external. All show, no tell. God was about to prune Israel in a way that would confound them historically, the exile. And I'm here to declare that God still expects us to bear fruit. And here's my message. Pruning is not punishment. It is a sign of love, a gesture of love, something that stimulates growth. And it's essential for a plan. It's essential for us. In what ways might God be wanting to prune you in your life and in mine? The deeper message holds true that we are only branches. Cut off from Jesus, we suffer, we wither, and eventually we lose our way. I don't want to think of how many people today need this message. Because many people, quite honestly, look like rootless plants with no depth. Their faith lacks direction and purpose. If they don't get what they need, they give up. Many people start off Faith in a flash, and they get all excited and fade fast. Abiding is not our strong suit as people, even as a society. We all know a lot of people who abide for a season, but then they lose interest. I mean, to allow anything, even Christ himself, to captivate our hearts, it sounds extreme over the top. Or is it really more essential than we know? Ask yourself sometimes, will I abide in Jesus or seek other sources of life? Will I nurture faith or let it suffer from neglect? Will I depend on Jesus or just myself? And to whom will I give my ultimate loyalty? What is at stake is the vitality of your faith and the fruit you might bear. Apart from Jesus, we're not going to endure very long or very well at all. This man came up to me after church service in my previous call. He wasn't a regular, and he was not a man given to much emotions. But that day, he had emotions. That day, he had tears in his eyes. He didn't want other people to see him when he told me. He said, you know, when Jesus and I are close, I like who I am. When we are distant, I'm a disaster. And I looked at him and I said, Ditto. Same for me. When I abide in Christ and he is at work in my life, I like me. When, I am, when we are distant, I'm a wreck. I'm no good to myself or other people. And I wish I could stand here and say that I was always close, that I was never felt like that man did, that it would be a lie. My friends, our destiny is to love Jesus, not just to admire his words, but to love the man himself. So don't make it complicated. Open your heart and your soul to him. Daily invite him in to what you do. Converse with him. You don't have to be in a sanctuary or formally kneeling or doing things a certain way. Just open yourself up to him. This is what allows his life to fill yours. You see, vineyards do not grow and bear fruit magically with no effort, and neither will faith. If you leave faith to chance, you will suffer. And that is the urgent word I bring to this time, not just to this community, but to all communities. It is so easy to pique people's interest in Jesus, but it is so hard to sustain their interest. Jewish rabbi was approached by one of his best.
asked students with a question. He said, sir, why is it that many who come to seek God are zealous, but they fade quickly, while others are faithful for a whole lifetime? And the rabbi was silent a moment, and he said, you see my dog over there? One night, a large rabbit ran right in front of us, and my dog jumped to his feet and took off a lot of pursuit and ran and ran. And soon other dogs joined in the chase and ran and ran, always barking and barking and barking, getting to the rabbit. Suddenly, all the other dogs trailed off, except his. And the young student said, I don't understand. He said, the other dogs have not seen the rabbit. They'd only heard her barking. And unless you've caught sight of the object of your desire, the pursuit, the chase is hard. It is very hard. If you lose sight of the object of your desire, you'll give up the chase. My friends, here is my main point. There is a big difference between just trying to follow Jesus and do what he did. Good luck with that. Versus believing that he lives in us and wants to live his life through us. When people need us, there ought to be something to trigger them to say, wow, I didn't know a life like that it was possible. The great mystic Thomas Merton was reflecting on these words of Bible in Christ. And I want to leave you with this image because I think it's priceless. He said, it's like trying to catch a plane. You are late. Your speed to the airport, every delay gives you ulcers. You park, you grab your stuff, you race to the gate, you rush on the plane, you flop down in your seat. destination just by getting to your seat. And you may go other places, but for now, you're not upset. You are at peace. This is what being in Christ means. You're taking a journey, but in a way, you've already arrived. You have. In Christ, you have all that you ever need. And always will. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your word and for all its many reminders. In Jesus' name.
conviction and assurance of 2,000 years of those who have placed their trust and confidence in Christ. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, the only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, but was crucified and dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sits on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From the next he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the life, and the life of the last. Please be seated. Again, welcome to all of you. This beautiful day, hoping that it is spring, is truly here and will not play games with us any longer. So uh, we do have, uh, uh, as you know, through word and email, we had another passing. Regina DeSauer passed away, and there will be a service of remembrance for her next Saturday at 2 here in the sanctuary. Please remember her family. Jerry Holmes' uh, celebration of life service has been delayed until Mother's Day weekend, uh, as requested by the family, and best for them. Uh, we, we will certainly give you other reminders as it gets closer. Are there others, any, any other prayer requests that we need to lift up today? I, I yeah. think the situation Israel and Iran and that whole mess over there needs to be Yes. It's gone from ugly to awful. Yes. Bless her heart. Tomorrow morning. Hey, got a smile on your face too, according to you know. <laughs> Others. Bless her together as God's people. Holy God, all the days of our lives are gifts from your hands. We give you thanks and full credit for all the blessings that we have received. And may we strive to be a blessing to others. We do lift up to you those we have named, families who are grieving the loss of their loved ones, families who are living in the horrors of war and the fear of what it might do. We do pray not only for the Middle East, but ongoing prayers to the people of Ukraine, that you will give them the strength that they will one day be able to mount up with wings like eagles and to restore their world. Lord God, we ask your blessing upon our nation, conflicted in many ways and yet still a, a beacon to the world. We don't always live up to that, but let us as your people lead by example to shine our light rather than curse the darkness. To be examples of peace and goodwill and to put into place all those many things Jesus has told us to do daily. These and all our prayers we humbly offer in his name as we pray together the pray, prayer he taught his first disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. continue to worship God as we consider our offering.
prayer dedication as we close. Holy God, every act of giving and every perfect gift is born of you and of your unchanging love. It is in response to that love that we offer our tithes and offerings. Use them and us to advance the gospel of peace for Christ's sake. Oh, no.